I really appreciated the spirit of our worship this morning. I hope you were blessed. I know I was blessed by being here and, and participating in the singing and the prayers and all that we had uh, already. <clears throat> Pardon me. And everybody get you a Bible. And if you're one of our guests today, please reach under the pew in front of you. I was looking at my mother-in-law's red shoes. And, and right above her red shoes, there's a little rack under the pew. And it's got Bibles like this one, except they're cleaner. They're exactly like this one. And uh, they're a New International Version. And it's on page 1692. If you don't have a Bible, just reach right under there. Turn it to 1692. And you'll be in the right spot for our lesson today. <clears throat> this sermon series is about great passages of Scripture. They're fundamental to our understanding of Christianity and to our Christian life. Acts 2, <coughs> pardon me, the day of Pentecost, is certainly one of those scriptures. Now, if you were raised in the Church of Christ, if there's one scripture you know about, it's Acts 2. And if you were raised in a Southern Baptist Church, if there's one scripture you know about, it's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If you're raised in Roman Catholicism, if there's one scripture you know about, maybe it's Matthew 16, 18 and 19, you know, about Peter having the keys of the kingdom and that kind of thing. <clears throat> but let me tell you something. Acts 2 is kind of the center of the New Testament. It really is. And let me tell you something else. If you're a, a Christian, if you're a new Christian, if you're thinking about becoming a Christian, there's not a better thing that you could do with your Bible reading than to start in the book of Luke and read from the beginning of Luke through the book of Luke and then through the book of Acts. Luke and Acts is a two-volume work that really does tell us the story of the beginning of Christianity. And if you want to strengthen and ground yourself in the faith better than any other thing I can think of, spend this year reading the book of Luke and then the book of Acts and then go back and do it again and do it again and do it again all year long. <clears throat> you will have a real basis for your faith if you will do just that very thing. It's the story of Jesus and his church. Now, the heart of Luke Acts, the heart of Luke Acts is Acts 2. It's a two-volume uh, work. You can think of it like a miniseries, part one and miniseries part two on TV. If you were to think of it as a human body and you opened up Luke and Acts and you saw the heart beating there, the heart of Luke Acts is the second chapter of Acts. It's the thing that pumps the blood to all the other parts of the body, from the beginning of Luke to the end of Acts. <clears throat> in the last part of Luke's gospel, Jesus was talking to his apostles, and he was telling them that all of the prophecies of the Old Testament were being fulfilled in the things that were happening. And in Luke 24, verse 46, he said, Thus it is written that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and then he said, and repentance and forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name among all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now everything about Christ and his suffering and his resurrection, that's in the gospel of Luke, see. And everything about the preaching of the gospel in the name of Jesus starts in the book of Acts and it starts in Acts chapter 2. And if the book of Luke and Acts is a teeter-totter, Acts chapter 2 is the fulcrum in the middle. It's the very middle, it's the very heart, it's the very core of Luke Acts. Now, <clears throat> if we understand Luke Acts correctly, the way Jesus himself explained it, the entire history of the Bible is coming true, is coming to pass, is coming to a fruition in the events that are described in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Christ had to come to the earth, right? He had to live a perfect life. He had to die for our sins. He had to be raised from the dead. That's the book of Luke. But the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation, was not complete until all that happened. And then it was first preached. See? Salvation in Christ was first proclaimed in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. It is an extremely important passage of Scripture. Not because we think so or anybody else thinks so, because it just is. And you need to understand it. Now, in Luke 24, 49, in the last chapter of Luke... If you want to flip your Bible over to the book of Luke, the very last chapter, it, it, Jesus is just talking to them about how that prophecy is fulfilled in 
the death and resurrection of Christ and repentance and salvation is going to be preached in his name at Jerusalem. And then he says to his apostles, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city. And he's talking about the city of Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. If you go back to Luke 24, verse 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning where, church? Beginning at Jerusalem. So he tells the apostles to stay in the city of Jerusalem until the promised Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then they're going to start this preaching. Now turn over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You know, when you watch a miniseries on TV and you've already seen part one and they start part two, they're going to tell you what happened last week at the beginning of part two, right? They're going to catch you up to speed. And that's exactly what happens in Acts chapter 1. Acts 1 and Luke 24 overlap with each other, see? And so in Acts 1, you're on that last day right before Jesus ascended into heaven. He's talking to the apostles whom he had chosen, Acts chapter 1, verse 2. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says to them, You, talking to the apostles, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the ends of the earth. Now, in the last chapter of Luke, where did he tell them that the preaching of salvation would begin, church? In Jerusalem. And he told them that they would be the ones doing the preaching, but they're not going to start their preaching until the Holy Spirit descends upon them and they receive that divine power. In the Gospel of John, and you don't have to turn there, in chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus told his apostles, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come to you and he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So all of that, folks, every bit of that is coming down to it. It's happening when we come to Acts chapter 2. Now in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, this is where it happens. I'm going to quote a little bit more than you have on the screen. When the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. And if you look back up at chapter 1, verse 26, we're talking about the apostles. And suddenly there came from heaven the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues or other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterances. Now, in Luke 24 and in Acts 1, Jesus told them to wait there in the city of Jerusalem until these very events happened to them. And at the moment that these events transpired, it would be then and only then that they would begin for the first time in history to preach the completed gospel of Jesus Christ about his death and about his resurrection and about the eternal plan of salvation. Now, as Peter and the eleven get up to preach in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, they are telling the crowd there that what's happening in Acts 2 is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, all of the prophets of the Old Testament. Particularly, they point to one prophecy, Joel chapter 2, But he quotes it in Acts 2, verse 17. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will uh, will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, will I pour forth my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. The thesis of the book of Luke and the book of Acts is, That with the events in Luke and Acts, the last days have arrived, see? The time that all the Old Testament prophets were looking forward to has come now. And if you'll look at that prophecy in Acts chapter 2, when you come down to verse 21, this is the punchline of the prophecy. When you see all these things happening, and Luke has shown from the beginning of Luke that it's happening. Let me give you some examples. You know, the prophecy says... In the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit and there's going to be prophecy. Well, in Luke chapter 1, you've got Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, prophesying. It says she's filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. Luke 1, 49. 
And Luke 1, about 60 some odd, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. In that same chapter, Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. In, in Luke chapter 2, uh, Simeon, the man in the temple, the Holy Spirit is upon him. And he takes the little baby Jesus in his arms and he prophesies. And he says, Now, Lord, let thy servant depart according to thy word in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. You know, he's prophesying. And then right after Jesus goes out of the temple, uh, Anna the prophetess is prophesying there to all the people. And then Jesus is baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And he's doing all these things. Isn't that exactly what the prophecy of Joel said? In the last days, what am I going to do? I'm going to pour out my spirit. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Isn't that what Luke has been showing is actually happening? See? And now in Acts chapter 2, we've got another example of that. When the Spirit of God comes upon the apostles and they begin to speak in other tongues. And so it's obvious that what Joel was prophesying is actually happening. See? And so in Acts chapter 2 verse 21, the prophecy says, When you see all this stuff happening, then whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, then we come to point number one on your outline. Say, it's about time, preacher. Pentecost basics. Jesus is Lord. And here's what you've got to realize. What Luke is showing us is that that prophecy is happening. And the prophecy itself says, when this is happening, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what the whole point of the Sermon on Pentecost is? It is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that you must call upon Him. You must trust in Him. You must depend on Him. There's nobody else you can depend on except Jesus. He is Lord. And he begins to prove that, beginning in Acts 2, verse 22. Right after he says, Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord. He says, Now, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved by God unto you by many miracles and signs and wonders which God did by him in your midst, even as you yourselves know. Him, Jesus, being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you all, by the hands of lawless men, did crucify and slay whom God raised up. See? As quick as he says you must call upon the name of the Lord now to be saved, he starts talking about who, church? Jesus. His death, his miracles, his resurrection. And he uses three points. It's a scriptural sermon. Three points to prove that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. First of all, he quotes a scripture from the Old Testament. It's rather lengthy there. It comes from Psalm 16. But the heart of it is this. David is writing the psalm and David says, I think it's Acts 2.27, You will not leave my soul in Hades... You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. David was prophesying the resurrection there. Look at verse 29. Talking about David's prophecy. Being therefore a prophet, talking about David, and having sworn with an oath that God would set one of his descendants upon the throne, he, David, foreseeing this, spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was his soul left unto Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So point number one, the Old Testament foretold that Jesus was going to raise from the dead. Point two is in verse 32 of Acts chapter 2. This Jesus did God raise up whereof we are all witnesses. In other words, we ate with him after he rose from the dead. We saw him. We touched him. Thomas stuck his finger in the nail prints of his hand and stuck his hand into his side. Into his side. We for 40 days experienced appearances of the risen Lord. We've seen him. We know that he's raised from the dead. This Jesus did God raise up whereof we are all witnesses. Point three is in verse 33. The miracle of Pentecost. That is the sound of the, the wind. The cloven tongues of fire that sat on the heads of the apostles. The speaking in other languages that they had never learned. That was done by Jesus who is now alive. Look at verse 33. Being therefore at the right hand of God exalted, that's Jesus, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, that is Jesus, the risen Jesus, 
has poured forth this, the miracle, which you now see and hear. What could they see over the heads of the apostles? The tongues of fire. What could they hear the apostles doing? Well, they were speaking in the languages of all those people when they'd never learned them, see? Who did that? Jesus did that, see? Therefore, verse 36, look at verse 36, Acts chapter 2. Therefore, see, since the scripture said it was going to happen, since we've seen him alive, since this miracle on Pentecost proves it's true, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for sure what? That God has made this Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now go back and put your finger on verse 21. When you see this prophecy fulfilled, you will know that whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is Lord, church? Jesus is Lord. That's the point. That's the bottom line. That is the thesis statement. That is the conclusion of the Pentecost sermon, that Jesus is Lord. God has made him Lord, Master, King, ruler of all the universe. It blew the crowd away. It blew them away. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you, whoever you are here this morning, really believe, have you been convicted, as this gospel sermon would convict you, that God really has made Jesus Christ Lord, Master, Ruler, King of the universe, that He truly is in charge that he is the one that has all the authority, that one day will stand before him in judgment. Do you yourself believe that? Have you been convicted of that? Well, if so, since Jesus is Lord, then I think it follows that we've got to do whatever he tells us to do. Is that right or wrong? If he's master, if he's ruler, if he's the anointed king, the Christ, then we've got to do what he tells us to do. So this crowd is hit with that, that he's Lord and i got to do whatever he tells me to do. So what's going to be their very next question? Look at verse 37. When the people heard this. When they heard what? When they heard and understood for sure that God had made Jesus Christ Lord. They said, okay, well then what does he want us to do? Doesn't that make sense? If he's master... And we've got to do what he says, then what are we supposed to do? What does he want us to do? And that brings us to point two on our outline. It's really Peter's outline. Repent and be baptized. That's what Peter said. Okay? Now let's break this down. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized. What does that mean? Repent. That's a church word. That is a word which means absolutely nothing In today's world, repent. What does that mean? There are three C's, I want you to remember, that are included in the word repent. The the Greek word literally means to change your mind. But I want you to remember three C's that are included inside of the word repent. This is what Jesus wants all of us to do. The first is conviction. If you are not truly convicted that Jesus Christ really is the risen Lord, if you're not truly convicted in your mind of that, then you can't repent. It's impossible. So inside of repentance, number one is conviction. You've got to really believe it. See? All right, that's number one, conviction. Number two, C, conversion. Conversion means a change. See, if you really are impressed with something to the point that you believe it for real, then it changes the way you think. And that is what we mean when we talk about conversion. It's a change in your mind that takes place, see? Your whole attitude changed. Now you're really focused on Jesus, and now you're really open to what he wants you to do. That's conversion. The third C is absolutely necessary for repentance. Commitment. Commitment. Commitment is when you make a decision. You not only believe it's true, but you forget all your rebellion, you forget all your excuses, you forget all that stuff, and you say, I'm going to not resist Jesus in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to commit myself to do whatever Jesus says. You could call it a decision, but uh, conviction, conversion, and commitment are all included around that word repentance. 
What does Jesus want us to do? Repent. That's biggie. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, verse 30. That's the biggie. Next, he says, be baptized. Baptism is immersion in water. It is a visual depiction and reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We are baptized into his death, Romans 6, verse 3. We are baptized into Christ, Romans 6, verse 3. We're buried with him in baptism, Romans 6 and verse 4. We're raised with him to walk a new life, Romans 6, verse 4. We put on Christ. We clothe ourselves, Jason, with Christ. The clothing of salvation, like you had on your picture up here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. The passage says in Acts 2, 38, we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means because our Lord Jesus, who has authority, says so, that's why we're doing it. We're doing it in obedience to Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Or in Matthew 28, verse 19, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit means because God, God says so. See? So it's by the authority or in the name of Jesus that we're being baptized. What's the purpose? For the forgiveness of sin, says Acts 2, verse 38. When we're baptized into the death of Christ, we come in contact with the blood of Christ. In Christ, we have forgiveness through his blood, even the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. So we're forgiven of our sins when we're baptized into Christ. So Peter said in Acts 2, 38, if you look at the scripture, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Go to that next little chart there. If you do what Jesus said do, repent and be baptized, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, then there's a promise here, see? you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. The Holy Spirit will dwell in your body as his temple, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. He'll strengthen you in your inner being, Ephesians 3.16. He'll produce his fruits in you, Galatians 5.22. He'll help you overcome sin, Romans 8 and 13. The Spirit of God will come live in your life as a saved person. Verse 39, for the promise, what promise? If you'll repent and be baptized, you'll do what? You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and your children and everybody who's far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. Verse 40, with many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message, what was his message? That Jesus Christ is Lord And that we must do whatever he says. Those that accepted that message were baptized. How come? Because Jesus said so. See? They were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number. They became part of the ancient church. That was the day the church began. The day Christianity began. Last point. Devote yourselves. Are you devoted to anything? That's a serious question. In our world today, Americans do not like commitment of any kind. They do not like to tie themselves down to anything of any kind. Are you really, truly committed or devoted to anything? Anything, period. If you look at Acts 2, verse 42, these new Christians that just became Christians just took Jesus as their Lord. They devoted themselves. What does that mean? That means they really committed themselves to these things. They really dedicated themselves to these things. They really got serious about these things. They really put these things first in their life, see? They devoted themselves. Why did they do it? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Master. And Jesus said, I want you to devote yourselves. Is that a good enough reason, church? Jesus said, I want you to devote yourselves. To these things. What are they? Number one, to the apostles' teaching. To the apostles' teaching. What's so big about the apostles' teaching? Well, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. He said, you're going to be my ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5.20. The apostles were the spokesmen of Jesus. 
He said in, in the Great Commission, you go teach them, baptize them, and then teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. So the apostles are the ambassadors of Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's why their teaching is so important. How do we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching? One way you can do that is like I started the sermon. You can start in the Gospel of Luke and read through the book of Acts and keep doing it all year long. You can read the epistles of Paul. You can read the epistles of Peter and John. But we need to be devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching. We need to be reading and studying our word. Go to Bible class. Read your word. We, this church needs to be devoted to the apostles' teachings. Elders, amen? Amen. Everybody, we're going to be devoted to the apostles' teachings if we're going to be Christians. Number two, be devoted to the fellowship. Now, that's misunderstood. This is the word koinonia. It means sharing or participation. And in the context here of Luke Acts, it's talking about the sharing of our goods, the sharing of our money in order to do the work of the Lord together. It's talking about the contribution. How many of us are devoted, I'm talking about dedicated, to the sharing of our goods to see that the word of God is pro proclaimed around the world? God says, our master, our king, our Lord says we've got to be devoted to that. I'm just reporting it. I didn't write it. Number three, we should be devoted to the breaking of the bread. How big a deal is it that we come together on the Lord's Day and we take the Lord's Supper to remember that Christ died for us and rose from the dead, to remember that we're his people, to remember that we're bought with his blood, to remember our victory and the grace that covers us every day. How big a deal is that? It's such a big deal that Jesus, our King, said we should be devoted, committed to doing that. You need to be here and you need to be taking the Lord's Supper. You need to be participating in the Holy Supper, the breaking of the bread. Every Lord's Day, be devoted to it. And be devoted to prayer. Pray to God every day of your life. Strengthen your life with prayer. Invite God to prayer. Be devoted to prayer, see? Invite Him into your every day. Participate in the prayers of the assembly. Be devoted to these things. Bottom line of the Pentecost basics. I think Acts 2 is a great scripture. And I hope I haven't imported anything to it that's not really there. But aren't these three things really there? You've got to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Amen? I mean, that's, that's bottom line of being a Christian. And what does Jesus want you to do? He wants you to repent and be baptized. Some of you haven't done that yet, and you need to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then what does he want you to do? It's real simple. He wants you to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Acts 2 is so vital. I pray to God that I haven't stood in the way of the message, that you understand it and that God has touched your heart by it this morning. If we can help you today to do what Peter and the apostles told us to do in Acts 2... Please come as we stand together.